for 6,000 years. And he sits there and he goes, I'm ready. I'm like, you mean, you mean right now? Yes, sir. I want to know right now, how do I keep growing with God? I'm ready. And you know what I began to do? I began to do what I learned from you here at this parish. I began to train him up in the fundamental disciplines of a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the same stuff that you guys have been doing after your Emmaus retreats, after Curcio's, after all the one-on-one retreats. The four fundamental disciplines of a disciple of Christ. Did you know that there are fundamentals that we're supposed to have down pat? These are the fundamentals. So like when you think of the Olympics, we don't send new, new swimmers to the Olympics. We send seasoned swimmers, the very best, the ones who can do it the absolute best. That's who we send, the fundamentals. They've got the fundamentals down. They don't even think about doing the fun- fundamentals. It becomes natural. But we've not necessarily been trained up as a, a, a normal part of what we're doing. And that's what I'm doing now. That's what I do now as an evangelist. I go around because I started going to parishes and realizing I'm doing these evangelistic missions. And the parishes aren't prepared for follow-up. But this church has plenty of saints in this room that know how to do this follow-up. So I ask you again, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, who are your disciples? Who are you training up? So I said, I've, I've got to do something to help. I want, if I'm going to do these missions and they're not prepared, I'm going to get some raised. So Henry was the one who became my teacher. Henry's done. He finishes taking notes after an hour. I walk him through everything, how to do this with the Holy Spirit. How do you, how do you enter the school of the Holy Spirit so he trains us up into mature discipleship is what I was doing with him. And Henry closes the book and he goes, i got another question for you. I'm like, okay, what? He goes, you got this written down? I'm like, no, not really okay, you need to write this down, okay? He goes, no, I'm serious. You need to write this down because there's other people like me that need to know how to do this. And then he looked at me, he leaned over like only Henry would do, and it's so funny, I'll never forget. He just goes, when are you gonna get it done? <laughs> I'm like, you mean like you want a date? Yes, when are you gonna get it done? I'm like, you're serious? Yes, sir. Grabbed his pencil and his pad, flipped it open, I'm ready. You mean you want a date? Yes. So I'm looking at my calendar now, and I'm thinking, okay, I could put this together in seven months. What's your phone number? (laughs) Now the student has become the teacher. And then he said, Nadeekin, I'm going to tell you one more thing. I'm just a simple man. I work in the barn. I work out in the field. I don't need any fluffy language. I just need you to give it to me straight. Just straight up. No flowery, just show me what I got to do. And then he said, that's what I want you to get done. I'm like, okay, great. And so that's what I did. That's what these are. That's what I brought out there. See, my ministry doesn't go around and give programs to parishes. What I want to do is I want to equip the saints. On the last page is a little sheet that you put on your mirror. For every day that you do your Scripture reading, you circle it. Because for me, when I first started, it was just too easy to fall back into the world. And I needed something to remind me. So every day that I got up and I did my daily prayers, when's the last time I went to confession in that month so that I would make it a virtue? It's got to be practical. It's got to be constant. And we got to help each other walk the journey. Some individuals in this church, I know, want to start small groups. training each other up, but not just to learn the Bible, to replicate ourselves as disciples of Christ, to replicate ourselves, because it's too easy. Look, we got to start helping each other, but if you're like me, I wore my mask, and I wouldn't let anybody know that I was a sinner, and I struggled. In this very parish, I acted that way. I was your youth minister, and no one knew that I was struggling with sin. I referred to it last night. I was looking at those pictures and those magazines, and next thing you know, I got addicted. And actually, it was on one of your youth retreats that I confessed to my group. It didn't replace the sacrament reconciliation, but God said, I need you to talk to them. You need the help. And he took this little boy who was hiding in darkness, 
And he picked him up and he put him in the light, the light of the body of Christ. But we're so afraid pretending that we can't be authentic. And there is a world out there that is starving to find out whether God is real. But how do they know if God is real if we're still pretending and we're so afraid? So for me, what had happened? The first time, the enemy hunts like they do of our marriages. And I was tempted. I walked into my brother's closet and found those magazines. And I heard two voices. One voice said, oh, run away. This is bad. This is not good. And the other voice said, oh, come on. You're not hurting anybody. You're just looking at pictures. By the way, that's the second kind of lie. It's called a rational lie. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just looking at pictures. Of course, I wasn't thinking about consequence, like the day that I would be sitting in front of my wife and confessing to her that her husband lied to her and didn't tell her that I was struggling with this addiction before we got married. And I didn't see the day that I'd be sitting in front of my daughters when they turn 12 and I take them out to dinner and I put a ring on their finger and tell them that I love them, but their big dad is supposed to be strong and the protector fell in this big pit and I needed to ask my little girls to forgive me. I don't see the long term. I'm just looking at the immediate gratification of the moment. That's what sin does. So what do they do? We think, you know what? I'm in control. I don't have any problems. But what we don't realize is all of a sudden, the minute we buy into one of those rational lies and that temptation, we take it and all of a sudden we get this chain. And now, boom. You notice it's not just a loop. It's got a loose end. Why? Because we're not in control of this loose end. Guess who is? The little critters that love to be around us. They're called demons and they love to work on us a lot. And you know, the thing about venial sins is they may not separate us from the life of God, but what they do is they darken our understanding so that we don't know what is true anymore. We're so accustomed to the level of impurity that it becomes normal. Normal. Everyone's doing it. So if everyone's doing it, it's okay, and that's a lie. It's not okay. You were made for more. You're made for the beatific vision. You were made for righteousness and truth. You were made for strength and love. But they want to convince you otherwise. And the minute you buy into their lies, you take on a chain and it darkens your understanding and it leads to, gosh, just more sin. So, you know, if I look at pictures in a magazine, then maybe I can look at pictures that move. How cool is that? And the next thing you know, it just keeps growing. And I think like I'm in control and I know what's going on, but I don't realize that someone else has actually got more control over me than I do. And so I keep going and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, if the pictures can move, then maybe I could see some of this stuff for real. And so next thing I know, I'm just like head over heels, totally involved in sin. And I'm thinking it's fine, but I'm going home to my wife and saying everything's fine. I love you. My life is just so wonderful. I'm in control. I don't need God telling me what to do. I don't need a superhuman being, a spiritual being, a divine being telling me what's right and wrong. I'm capable of dealing with stuff on my own. Really. Is that why we aren't capable of entering the beatific vision on our own? You know, since I've been on the road full-time over the last six years, the one thing I've realized is that, that I told you that last night, that demonic peace is huge. Parishes don't realize that they have demons assigned to their parish. And that they want to render you inactive and immobile. They want to keep you away from the Holy Spirit. They don't want you exercising your gifts in the Holy Spirit. They don't want you to be sons and daughters of God. And so I started to get trained up in deliverance ministry. And, you know, I've worked with some priests at Steubenville, and, and I've, I've been a part of some exorcisms. I've seen some pretty crazy stuff. But, you know, you want to know what is the church's strongest right of exorcism? You want to know? I'll show you. Father, forgive me, for I've sinned. It's been two weeks since my last confession. I absolve of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't realize that these holy men have been given bolt cutters. 
And their mission is to set us free. Their mission is to help us get free. And yet we're so afraid. We're so afraid of what they're going to think. I can't stand in line for confession. People will think I've sinned. <laughs> but if we all come to a communal sin fest, then it's okay. I want you to understand that every time, listen to me, I'm going to say a statement. I need you to memorize this. Sin is, an in, uh, sin is an invitation to leave the truth and enter deception. Sin is an invitation to leave the truth and enter deception. And every time we choose sin, we choose to leave the truth and walk out and live in Satan's playground. The little ones to the big ones. My time is up. And you notice I'm still wearing two chains. When I was out there, people kept coming up and walking by and going, oh, bound today, are we? Or they're referencing my chains. And they're like, well, what are you talking? They're mentioning my chains. I'm like, what chains? Are you feeling okay? What's wrong with you? I was at this one church and I left mass and I was going to do an adult study and I began to, and I put my chains on in the sacristy and I came out and I went to get coffee and donut on my way to the, to the adult ed class. And this little girl comes walking up to me and she goes, um, Deacon Ralph? I'm like, yes, sweetheart. She goes, oh, do you know you're wearing chains? And I said, oh, sweetheart, yes. Do you? And she went, I'm not wearing chains. <laughs> when I came here tonight, I went back there and I put on my chains. I knew I was wearing chains, but do you know you're wearing chains? You know, these chains are different than those. These are thick. We've had these for a long time. In fact, they're the two gifts we got from the garden. We lost an awful lot in the garden, but we got two gifts in the garden. Maybe you remember when they ate of the fruit, they looked at each other and they felt shame. Whoa, there's the first one. They felt ashamed. John Paul II put it this way in his Theology of the Body. That when, they, when they looked at each other, they recognized in each other's glance the ability to be objectified and they felt insecure. Shame. And they needed to go get covered up. So they went and they got the fig leaves and they made clothes. And, and then at that moment, Eve is asking Adam what he thinks of her new outfit. And God comes walking in the garden. And what do they do? Hide. Because they felt, and one other? Fear. Listen to me. Last thing. If you want to find corruption in politics, follow the money. If you want to follow find corruption in your spiritual life, follow the fear. The number one weapon of the enemy to prevent you from doing what you should be doing is fear and shame. And so in those times that I wanted to be holy and get rid of this addiction that I had, this is what started happening to me. I would run toward God, and next thing you know... And in those times when I felt weak and wounded and broken and I didn't want to do anything right, all of a sudden I felt this pull drawing me to this addiction and I had no power. That's why the Lord finally intervened with the youth group. St. Paul put it in Romans 7. I, what a wretch I am. I, I don't understand. All the good things that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do, I keep doing those. What a wretch I am. I don't know about you, but I got tired of living my life based on this. We make so many decisions of our lives based on fear and shame. So many decisions. So many times we avoid the sacraments. How many times have we come up with rational lies why we don't need to go to the sacraments? When the truth is, this is our freedom. When I finally started fighting to get free of my addiction, which took 11 years, 11 years, I had a mailbox outside the confessional. I was there so often. A mailbox 
Because I wanted to be free, and I, the freedom is not just free to be me. The freedom was the freedom to enter the life of God, to enter that love, that compassion, that, that desire to experience love and peace. I just wanted to come home. I wanted to feel my father's embrace. And the first time I tasted that from that day forward, I never wanted to lose it. Do you want to live with God or not? And if the answer is yes, then make it a priority to stay right with God. Make it your heart's desire to stay in love as opposed to running to sin. Because we know Satan makes all that really fun, don't we? Stay in love. Choose you this day who you will serve. The God who loves you so much, he would die for you. Or the devil who hates you so much, he would lie to you. love offering being offered, and we ask that those who are in the back pews to, to, to move forward so that we can keep the integrity of the sacrament. I ask you all to please stand as we say the uh, act of contrition, please. Oh my God, I am sorry for my sins. Please be seated. We're going to have Father Oscar here. He speaks Spanish and English. For those of you who don't want to go in the back, you can come over here. Uh, I'm going to be back here uh, on, on the left here. Father Daniel will be on the right, on, uh, on this side. Um, Father Lewis will be on, uh, on this side. Uh, we have Father Kish over here. Father Medina. Father Freddy. Um, I think more will come as, as the night continues. <laughs> 